before. I'm Phil Schneider. I'm an ex-government worker who worked uh, 17 years in the Black Projects, uh, otherwise known as the Skunk Works. I worked uh, predominantly uh, helping to design and build extremely deep underground military basing. Thank you. short overview of my background. I'm a structural engineer, both aerospace as well as uh, military applications. Uh, graduate of uh, University of Missouri as well as uh, University of Manchester, England. Special of France. Uh, so worked with uh, Fiat for a while. Cars by Fiat. Um, I did a lot of work overseas, but predominantly my field was underground mountain basing, also uh, submarine basing. Uh, I wrote uh, uh, several treatises on. Uh, analyzing rock formations by grain structure and this grain structure uh, would yield a certain pattern and that certain pattern could be used to analyze and chemically analyze and make special explosives that could be used to uh, blast out large caverns underground uh, and even when there were caverns, it could still use shape charges to blast the air and rock, although a lot of it was done by laser tunneling and drilling. Uh, I, I have a copy of a book here. Uh, I can't sell it. It's my only copy. But uh, uh, this fellow can co corroborate with me. His name is uh, Richard Souter, PhD. He can corroborate with me in regards to everything I'm talking about. Who is it, Guy? Richard uh, Souter, PhD. Okay, is another man that yeah. okay, we couldn't need to find the room. room. You need to give him your ticket. I will. And all that. I guess I'll let you know that, uh, that uh, the kind of the background of my father. My father was a, a German U-boat captain, responsible for uh, the sinking of 141 Allied uh, boats and uh, he got captured by the French, then captured, and then turned over to Third Army, U.S., and then uh, Third Army turned him over to Naval Intelligence, based out of uh, Pensacola, Florida, at the time. And, uh, he later went to work also in Navy Black projects. Uh, Maybe that's where I started, but it just worked out that way, I guess. Um, anyway, he worked for naval operations. He worked on the infamous Philadelphia experiment. He was involved heavily with that. In fact, I have some of his original notes. Uh, get it here. Uh, anyway, my father, J. 
continued to work in the U.S. Navy up until a couple of years before he died. He died two years ago, 1993, May of 93. And, uh, but his main contribution, other than the Philadelphia experiment, was uh, that he, he uh, was one of the principal engineers of the first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus. And uh, he worked with uh, Hyman Rickover on that project uh, to its fullest from start to finish. He helped design the nuclear reactor, he helped design the metals, uh, the containment vessel, he did all the machining of the uranium pellets that were used. Um, he designed the hull predominantly and some of the graving docks, and so he, he was a major contributor to such such today that even as ideas in air conditioning and filtration are still used today in, in all nuclear submarines in the United States. So, that's so much for my father. Um, he uh, taught me a lot. Uh, he's a pretty silent fellow uh, over time. He told me that uh, I should work in black projects in the desert regions. Uh, of course, I told him, I'm sorry, I have to work for a living. And uh, in, the, in the early day, in the early 60s, mid 60s, the uh, construction work worked and paid really tremendously. And uh, that's where I got to start. One thing led to another. And uh, when I went over to Vietnam, I got uh, 10 times what a normal construction work would get. And uh, but then the rest of us were great too. And when I got to uh, Hurt and recuperated some five years later. I hurt in 1970, and by 1975 I was bouncing around again. And so uh, at that time I went to work for uh, a number of contractors who were primarily uh, underground base uh, builders. And of course, I might give you a brief overview. The first underground bases were basically old gold mines. Just the tunnels were already there. Um, the first missile base, as a matter of fact, I believe it was in northern Montana, it was an old gold, the gold and silver mine. And the missiles are still in, in the old in the old uh, off, uh, air shafts. The air shafts are re-drilled out and everything. And, uh, actually, but they made a semi semi-hardened missile base out of uh, out of uh, an old gold mine, which is kind of unique, same place. Well, uh, the first, basically, the, the main part of the talk will be on uh, what I faced underground. Is, uh, is there anybody here that uh, is in the frame of mind that they can't take uh, gore or uh, uh, that kind of thing? If there is, uh, Get rather graphic. I don't like it, but I can take it. Okay, I'll tone it down a bit. But, uh, obviously, uh, this workshop basically is everything that I missed in the main talk yesterday. And of course, it's pretty hard to cram three and a half or four hours talk in 15 minutes. I've divided the talk into four, three topics. Uh, I'm going to talk about dumb bases. Deep underground military bases, all the dumb bases. Uh, right now, there are 131 of them. 129 are fully operational. Each one averages about four and a quarter cubic miles hollowed out underground at an average depth of 5,000 feet down. <clears throat> now, of course, some of them are shallower, some of them are deeper. Uh, they're strategically located. Uh, <coughs> They were uh, initially built to protect the President of the United States and uh, the government in general, the federal government as well as the political government. Uh, somehow, I, the number, the sheer number of the uh, 129 bases uh, with basically the size of, of a medium-sized U.S. city uh, uh, is kind of unfathomable when you dealing with maybe only 10,000 people in government that, are, that would be saved during a nuclear holocaust or war. 
So obviously these bases have other ulterior means. Some of them um, have already been used to in-house alien beings. Our government chooses not to let this out to the public for two reasons. The first main reason is that they don't want to panic the public. And their second main reason is that it would, they don't want the public to know the alien agenda. My first part of my talk will be talking predominantly about the alien agenda and what it means for us on planet Earth. And it's going to get, it's going to get pretty graphic. The alien agenda basically is thusly. Uh, aliens uh, of 11 distinct races have been arriving here on Earth in mass since 1946, predominantly, and maybe earlier. Actually, uh, probably the Bikini Island was one humongous underwater UFO base, basically flying disk base. Uh, and that was known in the early 1940. Uh, it was uh, March of 1940. It was known that there was a number of this activity at that time. Uh, the Japanese, before we got into war with them, they had a number of problems with uh, uh, flying balls of light, as they called them, or uh, uh, divine second wind, as they also called they thought they were godlike. Uh, however, the gods don't come down and murder the populace. So their idea of such uh, ended rather abruptly. Uh, there was, they became rather frightened. And they declared war with us, they, hoping that if they lost the war, and this is strict, strictly skeptical at this point in time, because I've heard this from only three different sources, both the U.S. Navy. Uh, that, that if we captured enough territory, maybe we could leak them. And uh, that would solve their problem. But and although that's pretty skeptical, I can't prove that one way or not. Um, the alien agenda basically is to take over planet Earth by another race of beings, or races of beings. Um, the U.S. government has known about this alien agenda at least since early Hitlerian times, probably as early as 1933. Uh, the reason for that is the Third Army, uh, under Patton and others, uh, just afterwards had allured that there was some other agenda other than World War II that, that was an immediate threat to the people of this planet. Uh, in fact, General Douglas MacArthur was one time quoted as saying the very next war, that it was toward the close of World War II in 1945, he actually was quoted as saying, the next war we have will be not from people of Earth, but it will be from people. The world war, I'm talking about, or worse, will be from uh, races from the stars. And of course, this spawned a lot of speculative uh, science fiction writing and that kind of thing like that. It was all from then on, he was kind of looked at as a doddering old fool. Um, he was a very visionary man, saying, please, if anything, he knew about the alien agenda in World War I times. Let me go further back in history. The first UFOs seen in, and occupants seen in caves and uh, in and around Truth and Consequences in Mexico were spotted by U.S. Army Cavalry in 1909. So, this is a little earlier than most people have thought. Uh, supposedly, U.S. Cavalry had come across some, they were chasing some bandits, and uh, they chased them in this area, and uh, there were these caves, and uh, they were rather highly infested with aliens, and what they called the Silver Wing, didn't know what, what like all the wars around were, were a very primitive aircraft and, uh, and of course there was balloons and that was about it. 1909 was pretty far back in time. Anyway, uh, the alien agenda means as far as 
anything goes, as far as the government is concerned, it is the worst scenario they could ever face. Because it involves not only having to tell the public major lies in any window all the time, but and keeping the public out of their face uh, solely is breaking down. And I'm helping to do that because I remember my uh, forefather of this country, uh, George Washington, one time saying, an uninformed populace is a populace devoted to slavery. And so one must consider that if we become uninformed, uh, we ourselves have to take up battle against this kind of a scourge. If we're uninformed, uh, then we're defeated already. So uh, I'm not here to panic anybody or start a panic, but uh, I feel that by lying to the American public, this is not the uh, this is not the American way. And we need to do something about that. As a matter of fact, as I'm talking, we need to we need to also be talking and doing our homework regarding that. And, and there's a lot of people who say, well, I don't have the time. You can take 20 minutes a day, can't you? And then we can go from there. You'd be surprised what word about this after you found out one little truth, another, 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 and pretty soon it becomes a snowball. But back to the alien agenda. Uh, throughout the half, almost half of the deep underground military bases in the United States, the 62 of them, of the 131, uh, actually the 129, they're fully operational. The other two are under construction. Uh, uh, 62 of these bases are housing uh, both the tall gray as well as the short gray alien and all of their craft. And, uh, and of course, our government, especially the US Air Force and US Navy predominantly, uh, are trying to break this uh, their technology down into usable technology for our own self. Case in point is uh, this particular scenario. The F-117A, the B-2 bomber, maybe the Aurora, although that's not an accurate rendition of what it looks like. Uh, the, the airframes are predominantly made of alien metals, metals beyond element one. Uh, and metal composites, some of the skins of which are composed of rubber and carbon fiber. And, uh, and the airframes are composed of, uh, of complex carbon fibers mixed with uh, elements such as marinite, which is element 123, which is extremely stable. I just kind of slapped this together. It's not quite as professionally done as these. But this was in Saudi Arabia. At that time, they had 58 of these. This was half the fleet. And I'll give you a few statistics of these aircraft. First of all, it's got a radar absorbing material. That's the coal black coating. Uh, it's a it's a type of a, and in a while, I'll get out some alien artifacts for you, some metals and some some of the, the doping or painting uh, that trips off of this when the aircraft is heated up to a white hot condition. And uh, anyway, these are specially hangered. They have to be kept cool. They have to be uh, kept at a temperature of 60 degrees, roughly, uh, when they're not moving. Uh, there's faceting on the edges. The fasting is a scalenohedral crystalline form. It's a crystalline form that predominantly does not occur on planet Earth, and it is an alien, it, once again, alien technology that has been adapted to Earth type or terrestrial type technology. Uh, these ideas were first thought of in, in Soviet Russia, and later they were adapted. They couldn't use that particular kind of a uh, thing in, in the early 70s. And so one of their scientists defected, came over here and started to work immediately with Lockheed. His name was Subokov, I believe was his name, Anatoly Subokov, Alexei Subokov. 
this fellow was also a pioneer and such. His name was Paul Benowitz. Uh, he was going to go public with the UFO and the alien agenda thing. He was, uh, he was a CIA pilot. He was also with the U.S. Air Force. Of course, they couldn't let that happen, and so they, um, they uh, stuffed him in the trunk of a car one night, took him off to a mental institution, and uh, made him into a, a mental vegetable. He can't even write his own name today. If it wasn't for a brother who spent a million dollars and a sister looking, looking for him, uh, he'd probably still been rotting away in some institution somewhere. we've got here, like I mentioned, is, is alien, basic alien technology that was adapted uh, for us. Uh, um, Paul Benowitz, once again, he developed and uh, developed the shape of this aircraft as well as uh, the, uh, how the bombs were to be dropped. He was also into other projects through Los Alamos. Uh, this is in Saudi Arabia, and uh, I'll tell you a few statistics about this during the Gulf War. Would you like to borrow this? No, sure. Thank you. Uh, during the Gulf War, this particular aircraft uh, had four large bombs underneath. They were called smart bombs, uh, cruise missiles, and also rockets and uh, machine gun fire. Vulcan cannon style, but even more advanced than that. I don't really know quite about that. Um, there was one pilot that sat in here. He literally had to be crammed in, actually right up in here. They had to literally wedge him in there and uh, took a certain weight and size of individual in this aircraft. And uh, all the Computronics was made by Mitsubishi uh, Computronics and Heavy Electric Industries. Uh, the uh, jets were both uh, turbine as well as nuclear powered for extremely high flight. Uh, by the way, the smart bombs that were used in the Gulf War, uh, 58 aircraft ran 3,706 sorties or missions. 100% of the bombs hit the target. 100% of the rockets hit the target. Uh, shot up to completely destroyed the Iraqi air, uh, Iraqi air defense systems. Uh, it was a 100% system. Only one aircraft suffered one small uh, um, hit, or actually where a missile just barely missed it, and it just chipped out part of that, but the aircraft was able to make it home. It was a minor repair aircraft back in service. But anyway, now there, there's some 179 of these built. They're building about uh, one every other month. They're about, they're a $208 million aircraft, uh, while this one here is about a $188 million aircraft and it's fraught with problems. Although recently, the F-117A uh, Black Chat, as they're known as, um, originally housed uh, at Nellis Air Force Base Tonopah Test Range S-4, Room Lake, you name it. Uh, these aircraft employed a three-dimensional radar. Uh, everybody else's radar was two-dimensional. Uh, the, uh, the, the black jets employed a three-dimensional radar, which is far superior. Uh, and, and its Computronics too also had a Cray system to analyze, uh, analyze bombing targets and, and uh, it was also the first aircraft where the pilot wore a helmet, it was called uh, in a, uh, psychoenergetic range finding, it's a copy from the Russian technology, uh, Soviet Russian technology where uh, a pilot can think in his own language and arm his weapons and, uh, and pick his target from his computer. It's still employed uh, in a second and third generation. It's extremely accurate. It cannot be faked. In other words, if another pilot uh, decides to uh, commit sabotage and jump in the cockpit, the plane won't, won't, 
plane won't even begin to run, let alone, let alone uh, any of the missiles firing or anything else. So it's kind of a unique system. It's kind of like the signature gun. And of course, we've heard about those in, in different movies and whatnot. Now we have the Aurora, which is a trans-atmospheric vehicle. And the Aurora, there's four of them currently being tested. I know it's been refuted, too, by a couple of uh, local gum shows before my lecture. He says, well, you, the Aurora doesn't exist, Bill. You know that. I said, well, really? And he says, well, I guess you don't think this exists either. And that was a picture. That was this map. He said, no, that doesn't exist either. And I said, really? Hmm, interesting. I suggest you have a seat and learn something. But they have one surpassing the Aurora now, too. Yes, there are two other prototypes that are small space shuttles uh, capable of speeds in excess of 40,000 miles an hour. And plus, we also employ 29 prototypes of flying saucer and uh, are successful in piloting those at up to 90,000 miles an hour in the atmosphere without burning up. That's doing something because when you push, you go beyond Mach 3, actually beyond Mach 2.7, you, you ionize the air around it and uh, you, cause the, uh, you cause the elements of the air to actually catch fire and, and you need a force field around that system to exceed Mach 3 or Mach 4 without burning up because you'll be, you'll be as hot as a glowing meteorite coming out at about 30 or 40,000 degrees. Anyway, the Aurora, there's four of them flying. They fly day and night. Uh, they have 12 people in it as a crew. They can have a skeleton crew of as few as, uh, as, few as six. Uh, they can uh, basically leave uh, Tonefall Test Range at 7 o'clock in the morning, do a complete loop around Russia and China and take all the pictures. They're predominantly a spy plane. They can take pictures, come back for lunch. That's how rapid it is. They, uh, they attain uh, from basically zero. They're not once again, this aircraft, this aircraft, and this aircraft are anti-lifting bodies. They are not conventional winged aircraft. A flying saucer theoretically is a, is a uh, circular wing. Um, this one, these are not, uh, these are anti-lifting bodies. In other words, it takes an incredible amount of speed before they're able to take off. Um, this is, a, once again, this is all part of the, the one world government type system. Uh, I try to stay away from the political end, but it's kind of like the one world government system. Uh, uh, take over the planet and hopefully we don't have to tell the people of the planet what the alien agenda is. The alien agenda is uh, what probably never meant, the aliens never meant that we were going to alter the bargain, but the aliens were the ones back in 1954 who cut a treaty with us saying that, well, we'll give you a list of the people that we uh, implant and, uh, and the cattle we mutilate. Uh, and we'll give you the reason why and everything. Of course, that never happened. And they kept altering the bargain until finally, uh, uh, in 1979, Dulce, New Mexico, I was involved in that operation. Uh, we had gone down there to build a, a, an auxiliary base in the southern end of Dulce, New Mexico, already existing base on Archuleta Mesa. And uh, lo and behold, uh, when we drilled down, uh, we found aliens were already in there and have been in there for some time. Uh, I can tell you when you're standing, say, as I am here, to where this gentleman is over here, and that's an alien gray who's pretty much seven feet tall and the meanest looking bastard you ever saw and uh, uh, not looking like a human being, uh, you kind of get petrified. And as an engineer, of course, I uh, didn't carry a regular regular big 40 clunky 45 or anything built because it would get in the way. I carried tools and other kinds of things on my belt. And I always carried a small pistol, Walter BPK with a nine shot clip. And uh, I emptied one clip into two of these uh, alien critters as they call them. And yes, they are mortal. Uh, but I got also uh, as soon as that happened as I was reloading I never got got the clip into the gun, 
uh, they hit me in the chest with some kind of particle beam weapon that gave me a very high dose of nuclear radiation, similar to cobalt radiation, but not quite, even more nasty. And uh, I was in isolation afterwards for 50 some odd days, 57 days all total. And uh, it took another couple of years to recuperate. And uh, once again, I was in my, my body was in a traumatic situation. But here I am talking, so it looks like uh, here we go again. But um, I've got the scars to prove it. Uh, I can verify that they yeah. are there. Yeah, so they're there. there. It's pretty, it's pretty they gross. Are there. It's pretty gross, and uh, I don't want to. Uh, there are ladies. There's a lady, ladies present here. So let's uh, not raise the shirt here. But they're there. And basically, uh, in talking about alien agenda, we have to also be talking about what occurred over here. Uh, this is the Bikini Atoll test. Now here we have an actual extremely large, in quote, mothership um, right at the point of a uh, neutron flash cloud. That's like uh, two or three ten thousandths of a second after the initial blast. And of course, the, the date of this was 12 July 1946. Uh, you know, as we all remember, if we were, read our uh, history on uh, UFOs, and, how they started. Um, it was wasn't really known. As a matter of fact, uh, after Roswell, we remember that uh, there was a Senate hearing and, uh, and a House of Representatives hearing, a, a closed door session hearing, and, but a little bit leaked out in the public, and it stated that the government knew nothing about UFOs prior to that time. And these pictures. These different pictures with UFOs actually in the pictures, actually with the original language, show that um, I'm sorry, but this is right. uh, right. uh, actually show that the government lied to the Congress of the United States. They knew full well what was going on at least a year prior. And of course, uh, I believe the Roswell incident was uh, 2nd of July of 1947. This occurred, of course. Uh, 2nd of July, I think the earliest uh, A-bomb lab, uh, 12 July, 12 July, 1946, almost a full year before uh, they were supposed to know anything. And uh, here we have these streaks, and these are the classic discs that were, that have all been pictured like this, kind of look like the Top Hat series, as I call it. Some of them have a, a radiant, uh, uh, have a atomic, uh, have a atomic uh, propulsion system underneath it. Uh, you know, the streaks have all been confirmed as being just that. They're, they're a type 3A flying disc. And we have these small white dots, white dots. By the way, these guys here are receding from the ocean, taking the trajectory. They're getting out of there in the worst way. They'll probably not make it because of the radiation factor. But they're exceeding at speeds in excess of 13,000 miles an hour. And the white dots are exceeding 30,000 miles an hour as they're leaving. And they have actually changed the color. They've almost gone out of scope. And you're seeing a photograph, a very rapid photograph with a blurred image. Uh, some of the photographs go from a black splash or, or dash to this white dot system, and then they go out of the scope of what we call visual reality. Uh, and that takes some tremendous speed to do that. And this particular overview shot, which is an extremely rare photograph of an atomic blast, there's all, as far as I know, this is the only one ever shown to the public uh, of an overview of any kind. Uh, there are small dots and dashes, uh, basically, as I'd say, and these are old uh, garbage scows and ships and whatnot that they put in harm's way to see what the reaction would be of an atomic blast. And uh, I'm sure the atomic 
testing was conducted predominantly in case we had to be prepared in using atomic warfare to fight alien influence and they needed a cover story so this was a, a, the Russians and the Cold War and everything was a, just a perfect cover story although it later became more than a cover story as we all know uh, these particular photographs also show small uh, dots and dashes as I would say and all of them have been confirmed now this black system here in the atomic cloud uh, is actually time uh, being ripped up uh, the, of course the atmosphere and the clouds and everything and then time being warped by the initial blast itself and that's by neutrinos going through and ionizing space uh, ionizing the atmosphere and, and uh, whatnot but exceeding the speed of light so you produce an antimatter background and you get total blackness and of course here we have a other UFO similar to the ASU. Once again, uh, we haven't been told the truth on any of this. Uh, you know, we've been, and right here, also in this picture, in the bombing of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, this is of Nagasaki. Down at the bottom, we see the characteristic human face, uh, which is typical typical of all A-bomb explosions over populated areas, you will always find a human face at the bottom of the uh, mushroom cloud. Now, nobody really knows if this is just by coincidence or the makeup of the cloud or whatever. But these little dots and dashes, these white dots and dashes are receding at better than 30,000 miles per hour. And there are UFOs leaving the scene. Japan was infested with them. They had a, their Navy had counted better part of two million of them. Uh, toward the closing end of World War II. Once again, it's all part of an alien attack of planet Earth. It's been going on steadily since World War II era. It's still going on, only now it's subverted into, into large quantity, large uh, groups of human beings being actually abducted and implanted, and that's according to the Roper Report, which is part of the Remington Rand Corporation, uh, who did the reporting the Bigelow Holding Company. Now they're in a third generation report, and of that third generation report uh, that was sent out to all the clinical psychologists uh, uh, in the United States, 110,000 of them, uh, uh, stated that uh, basically women are being raped uh, by aliens. And I know as, as fantastic as that sounds, it's backed up by John Mack, Harold Wire, uh, an MD as well as a, a clinical uh, person. Uh, there's other, there's a, uh, John Mack is the most famous, uh, but uh, there's uh, some 90 concerned psychiatric scientists who are uh, trying to form an organization to uh, uh, prevent secrecy on the subject because it, they have mentioned this is nothing but government sponsored rape. 99.3% are women, 0.7 uh, or 7 tenths of 1% are men. Uh, they're abducted, implanted. So it's predominantly a uh, female, female uh, type of uh, monitoring system. So once again, the alien agenda is, is to disturb the natural progress of, of the human race and uh, two alien agenda uh, beings. And of course, there's another thing to mention, any outer space alien, regardless of who they are, how benevolent or how, how evil they are, they're, they're a biological hazard because we have no defense against their germs. Absolutely none. In fact, they can kill us just by, just by being around. Uh, I developed something like jungle rot, I still got it on my feet and on my back, and because of the Dulce New Mexico thing, uh, I get free hospitalization for the rest of my life. I think I'm a good guinea pig, I guess. Uh, but theoretically, that's from being around inside that cave at that particular time. Uh, that's the first time I've told any of you people that, but that's basically what it's all about. Um, uh, different time here. 
Um, well, we've talked about the dumb bases and the black projects predominantly, um, and the alien agenda. Um, I would like to stick to another subject it's called Strategic Defense Initiative. Of course, this could very easily be, as mentioned by my late friend Ronald Lee Rummel, who was murdered, incidentally, by the three people inspired to kill him. Um, one person did the killing. One was a uh, NSA officer, and one was an alcohol tobacco and firearms officer. Both are in custody as we speak. The third gentleman is fighting extradition. He's in Czechoslovakia. Uh, most likely able to uh, successfully fight extradition because uh, they don't follow the U.S. law very well. Uh, anyway, the Strategic Defense Initiative is probably, instead of uh, preventing incoming missiles, although they're now that uh, most nations have uh, favored and otherwise have nuclear missile technology, uh, uh, there's probably some form of uh, outer space defense, defense against outer space attack, and uh, you know, it's pretty primitive indeed. But it's better, better than nothing. And the second part of my talk will be aliens and the alien agenda. I've already touched on that. Old alien bases. Uh, and like I said, Bikini Island, according to what was uh, studied after the A bomb blast, at the, some of the caves that were infested with uh, out of place artifacts dealing with UFOs uh, and other kinds of paraphernalia had, had rock forming around them, so they had been basically an alien junkyard on the, in shallow seas for probably the better part of 10,000 years. So they'd been around, that we might call an old alien base. Dulce, New Mexico is another old alien base, or kind of a, a, a botryoidal or clear agate had formed over some of the uh, parts uh, laying on the floor of, of the existing base and uh, it takes an extremely long period of time for, geologically speaking, for this to form. Uh, uh, the aliens have probably been here the better part of at least a half a million, and maybe as much as several million years, although I have artifacts here which show uh, uh, artifacts that are uh, like a uh, small turbine looking at device sitting in 220 million year old fossil coral and I also have uh, alien metals which are present in, in other uh, kinds of rock formations including a piece of petrified wood where an insect had basically burrowed a hole around one of its limbs and then something had literally like a laser had literally sliced through it but the cambium or the or the uh, or the actual layers of the wood had bent as the beam burned its way through it. I've got that in here too, as well as an original piece of, uh, of instantly petrified, uh, uh, looks like a garlic root that was found in, in around Area 51. And uh, this particular piece of garlic type plant was instantly petrified, it contains the same exact chemical structure of the quartz crystal the quartz crystal only grows in a certain left-handed uh, crystal pattern, and that same pattern is extant on, on fossil, uh, instantly petrified or fossilized plant life of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's identical, chemically identical. So, uh, anyway, the next part of this, the second part of the talk are treaties. Basically, there were four different distinct treaties made through the United States government from the from the alien encounter. The first one is in 1944. The second one is 1954. The third one is 1962. And the fourth one was 1979. Now, I'll go backwards. The 1979 treaty uh, was a total violation of uh, 
incidentally in Tulsa, New Mexico, where I got badly hurt. Uh, 66 Secret Service and Delta Delta Force people lost their lives, 22 of which were uh, on loan from other countries: uh, Israel, Germany, uh, Norway, and, uh, South Africa. If I, remember. I was the only geologist, geological engineer down there to analyze the situation. Uh, the government almost basically lied to us. They kind of said that alien presence might be there, but they didn't tell us that they knew that there was an alien base and that they'd already already attempted to uh, make contact. And of course, this was disturbing indeed. In fact, a couple of the engineers who managed to survive uh, put the project under duress. Another part of the talk are the intelligence community. The Nazi group, the World War II Nazi or Hitlerian group, the Fatherland Intelligence Agency trained our CIA, our OSS, which became our CIA, and other intelligence communities <coughs> predominantly, and are still being employed today as we, today, as we, in quote, the federal government today uh, trains uh, Bosnian troops on American soil, and from what I understand, that's totally illegal, um, and that's another topic. Now, the third part of the talk is uh, the types of aliens. Um, the large gray that I, sh two large grays that I shot and killed. Uh, I can't tell you how ugly they were, and I can never tell you how graphic the stench was. But in the cave, there were large cauldrons or tanks. Uh, they kind of looked like a big uh, oval cattle feeding tank, but they weren't. They were special, looked like a stainless steel or metallic tank. And they were filled with alien uh, and human uh, body parts, and generally glands, and what looked like some kind of blood. Uh, uh, I've always been taught that blood after a few minutes starts to congeal, but this was uh, one of these uh, vessels that in the melee had tipped over and all this bloody liquid had spilled out with the mess and it was definitely not coagulated. Uh, how they did this is anybody's guess. So if we remember anything about cattle mutilations, we might also think that the, basically the blood in, the, in these cattle are totally drained out. Uh, there's no blood around them blood around in quote the murder scene of, of, the, of the cattle. So, um, so this might be the way they're doing it. Now whether this is uh, sponsored by our government or other governments is, uh, is, a good, is a good guess. If it were up to me I'd say yes we're in the thick of it. We made a pact with the aliens and therefore we must know what their agenda is and, and uh, also the federal government must also further know that if they keep the big lie going, they must be in the thick of it in the worst way. And if that's the case, they are, they are an enemy of uh, gross concern. Who is we? We, in quote, the federal government. The Department of State. Department of State, uh, Department of the Air Force, Navy, Army, Marine Corps, basic uh, force services, plus uh, the military policing. Facilities and the FBI and all the different, they're all hooked into the Black Projects as a whole. In this part of the Black Projects, uh, there's kind of like an outer sphere of normal Black Projects, like building and everything from these kind of aircraft here uh, and doing these kind of experiments here uh, to building aircraft like this places like this, and that's kind of on the outside. On the inside, on the inside of this circle, we get a, a tighter group of people who really know what the main agenda is, maybe even the enslavement of the human race as a remnant, uh, as, or, or something in as a scenario like that. And then finally, a third category whereby 
whereby none of the other two categories would even even hint at the possibility or the horror of what's happening. And it's a very compartmentalized system. I can only begin to guess, even though that I've been in thick of things from the outer core to the second core level, but I have no idea what's in the, in the third core level. No way at all. And because it's so complicated, I've heard some of this run by me, it's so fantastic, it makes a Star Wars or a movie or a, or a, a Star Trek novel, a Babylon 5 novel, it's like a kid's toy. I mean, it's too fantastic for me to believe, so. I can, I can assume that uh, other, it might be an uh, otherworldly uh, plan or scenario for taking over the planet, but once again, I can't prove it, so I don't talk about it. Right here, I'm only basically to discuss basically what I know of the alien agenda and through the underground military base. And, the application that I did during, during this kind of activity for the U.S. government. Uh, I'll have a question and answer period in a short time. I've already talked about uh, old firefights. Uh, I will tell you right now, I'm breaking major federal law, I'm breaking my entire security oath system. Uh, security oaths, in fact, here's a copy of my 1985 security clearance. You might zoom in on that here too. Can you do that? Yeah. yeah. Tell me when. Okay. And of course, it's got a picture of me. It's got Department of the Air Force. It's got uh, a control number here. It's got a digital control number and name here. It's got a UPC stripe here. It's got a level L. Uh, that was only issued to people that worked at Green Lake and Area S4 and R, Restricted Zone R4808E. This is a computer chip camera in the card itself. You didn't wear the card like you had, you wore another security card. This one wasn't worn. This was used to get you into the main gate. And there's a large machine. There was, I can't draw it. There was a large machine that looked like a kind of like a, 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 a curved uh, the bottom part you put the card in and uh, you put your thumbprint on you're supposed to actually some of them had two of them uh, I don't have a second thumb so this one was made of one there's normally two here in the L for a normal person would be up through the UPC stripe so there was one and I put my thumb there on the bottom and if it would flash green I flick the switch and uh, then I insert the card in the, the second part of the uh, control unit and there would be a thing that would hold my forehead and I could block off my left eye and I'd stick this thing up to my up to my uh, right eye and take a picture of my retina and then if the green light went off it would I could remove my card and I could leave it at the guard shack and I'd wait for anywhere from 45 minutes to several hours waiting for the next ship to start breaking all my security oaths by coming out in the open and talking about this because not only are we dealing with a kind of technology I believe that we should we should uh, be out that should be out in the public it should at least this kind of 50 and 60 year old material should be out in the public uh, I feel that, that in coming clean so to speak uh, I don't know quite how to explain it other than the fact that when I initially was told these underground bases was, were for uh, uh, security uh, in case of nuclear attack in the United States, and uh, it was a total lie. When I found out that aliens were actually entrenched in half of these bases, and uh, these bases, by the way, cost a minimum of $17 billion a piece. The black budget garners $508 billion a year, $1.023 trillion every two years. That's two-year-old information. It's probably more like $1.3 trillion now. 
which is about one quarter of the gross national product of the United States, it's no wonder why our economy is kind of up and down here and there. Uh, once again, you might ask, well, how in the heck uh, we've only been told, uh, we the public have only been told there there's a total defense budget of $447 billion, so how can that be $500 billion going on behind the scenes? First of all, black budget means hidden budget. Hidden budget is totally hidden from congressional view and oversight, cannot be audited uh, by the U.S. Treasury system at all. It is a separate, independent taxing body entity within the federal government structure, which, by the way, is illegal. Totally illegal. It's primarily financed by drug operations by the CIA and the NSA and the Drug Enforcement Administration, and now the FBI is implicated also. Uh, recently, there was an FBI man who came out of the cold, so to speak, and told all, only to find himself uh, murdered and took a vacation in England and got himself murdered. That was in the paper about three years ago. Anyway, nine attempts on my life have been taken all since the first of January of this year. Well, I've been shot at and run off the road three times and I run off the road, one of which is uh, very good driver. They used to race cars for somewhat of a hobby type living. Uh, I used to race everything from Formula One on down, uh, motorcycles and stuff like that when I was a kid, so I lived kind of kind of on the edge all the time. Uh, so I became a very good driver, a very defensive driver, and so if somebody's trying to run me off the road. Like before my Vegas talk, I dropped a friend of mine off at 29 Palms area and saw another friend in the, in the uh, Marine Corps hospital who was dying of cancer. And on the way out of there, you have to go, you have to skirt around a whole mountain range. You just can't take the easiest way in a straight line out. It'd be nice, but it doesn't work that way. You have to skirt around these mountains. And, uh, I had a Ford Taurus with a fleet interceptor motor. Like an eight-liter motor, just a real monster. And um, the, uh, there were two long E350, Ford E350 vans, and they all had uh, uh, Air Force markings on them. They were, uh, they all had guns, and they were all shooting, and they were missing. And, and uh, I flew by them and took a picture of their. Uh, as a blur, I took a picture of them, got a very good picture of their license plate. And uh, then, they, then they sped up and tried to, try to squeeze me in this way. And then finally, I just slid right in the middle of the road. And the road was wide enough for basically one-way traffic. And one of them went over, rolled over, and kept going down for about three or 400 feet down a very steep ravine. The other one was a shallow ravine about 10 feet deep. And, uh, I just kind of peered over, got my, got the hook my seatbelt, peered over, and there was a big fire started on down there. I could hear people screaming, but I'm sorry, that's their, their deal. I just kept on going. That was one way. Uh, recently, I got shot at when I was with a retired FBI agent. We were going to go to a Patriot talk show down near Salem, Oregon. And I got shot here, here, and here what's called a CIA cocktail. Uh, uh, I don't have normal ribs after Dulce, New Mexico fiasco where my ribs were burnt, cauterized, my fingers are burnt off of me, uh, etc. Uh, I have a plastic plate in here, a nylon plate that <coughs> has bumps on it, looks like ribs and everything, so those bullets just kind of just lodged in this thick, five eight inch thick plastic movable plastic thing on the inside and uh, uh, that was dug out and, uh, and once again here I am recuperating from another problem and all because I'm trying to bring the American public a 
and I love my country more than my life, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this ridiculous group of things uh, by coming clean, but I, I feel I have to because the American public was not only been lied to, but when I was asked to, um, by the intelligence committee within the Air Force to uh, continue my operations and black budget work, uh, stealthy work, uh, what would I think if I, if they said that I would be betraying the American public? I told them to go fly it, go stuff it or whatever. I says I won't be a party to that. And I walked out of the room. And somebody tried to tell me to come back. And I says, out of my face, fellow, you're on the ground. And he would get out of my face and went on the ground. And I walked away. And uh, an automated decision. talking. I also want to get a little political sided here, although I don't like to. Uh, right now we have an out of touch, runaway federal government structure that really doesn't care about the way you and I feel. Uh, they manipulate evidences of crimes as in several instances, both in both in Waco and other. Uh, the Waco hearings should have been a wake-up call to most who were watching, even if they'd only watched a piece of it. Um, it's once again pros the federal government structure is uh, just running away with everybody's freedom, and uh, they run roughshod over. They've actually become kings and queens over us, and our forefathers told us exactly what would happen if we, had, if we took a certain stand, if we had, if we made laws to legislate God out of our system, we would have a similar problem. If we made laws or, or had too many people making laws within our government structure, we would have a similar problem that we're facing today. We're facing a form of uh, tyranny and totalitarianism. Incidentally, I might want to throw a few statistics by you, and it's quite provable in a number of talks given recently uh, both by the United Nations and others. The United Nations is entrenched in our country. They're training our troops. So our, our troops are being trained by the United Nations in the United States, and I think that's kind of an oddball system. Uh, Russian troops are being trained of basically Montana and uh, North Dakota and the Northern Tier States. Washington, upstate Washington, et cetera. Uh, there's a stockpiling of Russian uh, tanks and hardware by the U.S. Army. For what purpose? Also, there, we have uh, purchased uh, at, uh, at the cost of uh, some $38 billion all the Russian nerve gas. Nerve gas is, uh, uh, their nerve gas is extremely long shelf life. We're destroying our own nerve gas, which has a relatively short shelf life. 15 years with the Russian variety is extremely deadly and also uh, I'll tell you something else about that the Russian nerve gas is composed primarily of, of glandular secretions uh, and they even mentioned that, uh, as they were downing flying saucers within their own uh, country they found a way of making chemical weapons from some of the uh, alien uh, alien cadavers and that kind of thing like that. So from some of the uh, uh, some of the glandular excretion. So once again, biological weapons against the people of the United States. Uh, there have been other talks given by other people alluring to this, including Ted Gunderson, who's an ex-FBI agent, who's got tired of the federal government tromping on him, and, and another. Uh, ex astronaut by the name of James uh, James Groden, not not the Groden of uh, Alternative Three uh, book fame, but this is another book. Uh, a number of key government people have started coming out slowly, but unfortunately, it's at a snail's pace. I'm the only one that ever worked and had a level three security clearance that came out from the cult, so to speak. Who laid everything open to the American public or any public? Uh, 
something like this was tried in Britain and in France with the person that uh, jailed. Incidentally, uh, I can't be charged with espionage theoretically because according to our uh, one person who said, oh, that, this place doesn't exist. Well, it's on an aerial map. It's kind of different. Uh, if it doesn't exist, then I'm just full of you know what, and hype and, and hooey, so it's fake and, uh, and uh, I'm just crazy or something like that. And so be it. And if it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Uh, and how can I be charged with a crime on something that doesn't exist? Another thing is that uh, uh, to be guilty of espionage, you have to sell four dollars or cents or some form of monetary gain the information that you impart. I'm not doing that in any way, shape, or form. The talk, the lecture, is counted. It's actual exchange of money by another individual for the information, for the proscribed information. Well, I'm going to be getting out a few alien artifacts here and let you take a look, and you're welcome to kind of stretch your legs a little bit and think. Put her off so it's here so you can see them. Talking about to look at very carefully, and I'll leave my hand lens out for you to take a peek. By the way, when you use this hand lens, you want to get right up on the object like this see a line going straight through with the wood layers of the cambium coming this way as whatever went through it went, burnt through it. It's very interesting. Awesome. And there's another out of place artifact of blue parts, so to speak. This is another fossil. This is at one time a cave mushroom, uh, a fossil plant something cut it absolutely perfectly like a, like a laser cut right through the thing and part of it slid off and it later got perfectly petrified similarly to the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bomb test with a similar signature and here's this petrified instantly petrified garlic plant incidentally this is 65 to 100 million years old, this is 105 to 130 million years old, and this is roughly 30 million years old. It has the exact chemical makeup and structure of quartz crystals formed on, it, on its surface and on the internal structure of the plant itself, which this, the top part of course, the, uh, the sprout is all broken off. This is the sprout underneath it. And uh, the quartz crystals are identical to material found at Hiroshima and Nagasaki after we talked spot. Now here's a bottle of, uh, of uh, the RAM coating of the black jets. Of course, when they're, they come in after their mission, they're glowing uh, red hot and they drip this stuff, particular material, off on this uh, in-coat tarmac. This isn't tar, it's a special cement. And it just drips. And maybe some of these aircraft, uh, you might see drip spots like here and here and there and in different places. So this is the material, it's like lava that drops off of it. It also contains certain alien elements, or alien reproduced elements. Here's a piece of fossil coral from Jordan, uh, having a small uh, particular uh, uh, non-fossil. Uh, it isn't a crinoid. I mean, it might be, some of you might know what a crinoid, fo crinoid fossil is. It's kind of like an underwater uh, uh, lily or plant, seawater lily, but it, this isn't it. This is actual machined out part, similar to a rotor fan, a miniature rotor fan. There's a small engine right there. This is element 123, which is uh, also in topoline, 
copaline and element 123. They're very much heavier in uranium. They're island of stability elements. They're uh, 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 by the way, these pieces of metal I've purchased with my own money when I worked for the government. As if they were test samples, they never bothered to pick them back up, nor did they pay me back for them, so they're my property. Uh, but it's a golden orange metal. Uh, the pure metal is, is, is pure gold and orange, and like lead, you can just carve it. It's a very peculiar metal indeed. Totally stable, cannot be, cannot be isotoped. Element 123 with an atomic weight of about 320, and uh, here it is. It's almost twice the weight of uranium. Where did that come from, Phil? Uh, that was uh, formed down at Dulce, New Mexico, and also there were scrap heaps and scrap piles of it in and around uh, Tone Pulp Test Range, which is uh, uh, right here. Tone Pulp Test Range is actually above the Rim Lake. Is that metal from our soil? Is it metal from our soil? No. This is an alien, this is a, two alien elements. And here, if I might show you, uh, I guess the brick lamp is not the highest of brick lamps, you know, not the I thought I had some, uh, yeah, here we go. This periodic chart was developed by a number of scientists anonymously, don't want their name revealed. Um, of course, all we're familiar with is element 103, and that's been around for a long time. And a couple of these were made in Russia. These that don't have any name, uh, they've, they're very short-lived indeed. Element 109 to 110 also. But after, from 111 to 140, these are all elements that were uh, garnered off of uh, you know, alien attack vehicles or alien spaceships or flying saucers when they were taken apart. Now topoline is here, uh, element 117, and element 123 is murinite. It's a combination of both those, an extremely hard substance capable of standing temperatures in excess of, of uh, 9,500 degrees Fahrenheit to as much as uh, 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this piece of material is uh, it's a kind of in a Florida leaf pattern. Uh, this kind of material is lighter than lithium. Of course, lithium is number three. You might want to point out it's number three on the scale. It's a, it's an earth, it's a terrestrial element, but this is somewhere between two and three, between helium and lithium. It also is an alien element. It's what they call a mixture, an admixture element. It's extremely light, and uh, it's uh, used in the airframes of all black jets and F-117A, B-2, uh, B-1, B-2, and uh, B-30, uh, or, or the uh, Aurora series. And it comes in a scalenohedral crystalline form, which is alien. It's kind of a dead giveaway. Here's a tabular scalenohedral crystalline form four times the hardness of a diamond, four times the tensile strength, capable of withstanding temperatures in excess of 45,000 degrees Fahrenheit before chemical breakdown, it is used in the window frag, uh, the small slit windows there in the underbellies and the blackened out windows uh, of the actual cockpit, although most of these uh, pilots fly blind. They, they don't ever see anything from the ground. So this kind of, a, that's also an alien material. And it is uh, element, uh, if I remember right, it's element uh, 113. Here is another alien uh, element formed in the confines of aero, uh, outer space. Uh, you might ask, what are we space shuttling? But all our shuttle missions, of course, we're being lied to every time they talk or open their lips, uh, open their mouth. Uh, the same crystalline structure is here as well as it is here. This material is the hardness of a diamond. It's also used in the uh, rotor and propeller shafts 
uh, of propellered aircraft or, or and or uh, rotored aircraft. Uh, it's also used in high speed drills and other kinds of things like that, which are, are used to uh, make uh, holes in, in metals that cannot be touched with a welding torch. And this, of course, is, is that hunk of metal. And I have a real treat here. When I was 14 years old, I was with my father who was talking to a Sir Johnny Rollins, uh, Sir Johnny H. Rollins, who was a, a British naval sea lord. And he had collected some of the crash retrieval uh, objects of the uh, of the infamous uh, uh, Roswell uh, crash, and these are actually little bits of the skin uh, that have. Uh, and of course, you remember the skin. You couldn't you couldn't bend it or, or cut it or anything. The way they did this, of course, they dropped uh, liquid nitrogen on it, and uh, they used a, they used a hammer technique of, of shattering it, and it became brittle. But once again, it's composed of nothing but alien elements, which are, by the way, not we're not able to understand where these this particular element come, elements come from in the skin. It's the, th the thickness of the sheets of paper you're writing on, and, uh, and that's all that's needed to be meteor proof and missile proof and everything else. And these things have crashed, of course, and they've also been shot down by luck predominantly, uh, not by skill, and I'll let you look at that, but I, I you can handle these other things, but don't handle this. You say they've been shot down, Phil, how would they have done that with a charge particle? Charge particle and beam weapon, as well as a uh, rail gun, a reusable rail gun. And, uh, if that works, they're going to stop them, you spray it out. No, not really. A rail gun is, uh, is an electronic gun that shoots a projectile about uh, 25,000 miles an hour, much faster than any rifle. I'll have a question and answer period. You can come up, take a look at these artifacts. Uh, here's a couple of magazines. Uh, spotlight. Uh, anyway, uh, here's. The Alien Digest, we got my friend killed here, some of my father's notes. Those are blanks there, but uh, uh, there's the famous popular science about secret airbase. By the way, if it doesn't exist, huh, how come they printed it? Uh, here's a Nazi saucer. That was done by Vladimir Chazersky, who was a, who was a Russian uh, uh, space engineer or some. Fame. Here's a new periodic chart of the elements. And go ahead and look through it. Incidentally, uh, here is a unique uh, piece of hardware too. It's an ordinary gold watch. Uh, the only thing unique about this particular gold watch is that it's a Waltham, but on the back, on the reverse, uh, it's made in Montauk, New York just happened to be used by my dad in the Philadelphia experiment. And it happens to be keeping a rather accurate time. Anyway, I need a seat. And I'll let you look. Can we get one of the heaviest here? Actually, the heaviest is the Myrnite, that kind of this gold, one? gold looking material. Be very gentle with these. These aren't the normal specimens. And hand, uh, one person handling one piece at a time. Can okay, we get a period of term like that? Yes, I do. These are four dollars a piece. A Celtic one. And uh, oh, a year ago, these were secret. About top secret. By the way, here's your. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Should it? If we take a look and we ask you to take your seat and we'll have a question and answer period and then I'll wrap it up. Okay. Uh, the aerial maps are $2 for one of those. Those are actual aerial maps. 
used at Groom Lake, and that, those were made in 1966. Also have uh, portfolios of, of selected selected pictures of the atomic bomb blasts uh, at Bikini, as, as well as Dal Thor. And if there's some of them need labeling, I'll label them for you after the talk. Do you have one like that? Yes, I do. You, as a matter of fact, I do this, I can't sell. Take a look inside of that, inside of that canyon, so to speak. I'm in an interesting formation. See how the uh, wood fibers have just literally been separated. Yeah, that's right. Of course, you've heard about straws and going through telephone poles uh, after a tornado. Well, um, maybe this was that kind of a thing, although it seems to be remote. Are those $20? Yeah, these are $20. They're a select group. Mm -hmm. Is there a crazy yeah. yes, yes. Well, I'll tell you what, the you, 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 I'll just throw this in. How about that? Inside these. There's a select group of pictures, uh, like here at the, the street, uh, saucers leaving ground zero. I have other ones that are marked uh, with uh, the USS Eldridge. This is, by the way, is the USS Eldridge. Uh, ready room it's a ready room aboard the uss eldridge and i think i'll be like we'll verify that and um that's one of their i think how many how many ready rooms is out here yeah how many ready rooms were aboard the uss eldridge theoretically two two i only do one because that's the only one i ever went in okay the lecturing varied between various lectures. Yeah, a list of people, lectures, different people. Not all the people, although you can do your homework and probably find that out. These are going to, after this talk, the, these placards are going to be duplicated on the special paper sent to the United States Senate, and of which these pictures will not only be totally declassified, but will be out in public domain. Taking a picture of all of them. And if uh, anything's not, not marked, like, if I haven't marked, I'll try and uh, identify them for you. Uh, I could give you a map of room A also. Sure. Anyway, uh, uh, radar absorbent material. This 
Yeah. So then you can take your portfolios and copy the actual Joint Army Navy Task Force language under those photographs, and that's the official language. I've, I've stuck my own word in here. Hmm? You don't have all of them in there. Yes, well, I don't have all of them, but there's a select group. Um, uh, we'll look through it and see the different ones that are selected. You know, that's exactly two years ago, you said, yeah. You got an A bomb disease, A class of the same. Some of your careers are atomic war veterans. Atomic war veterans. You want us to wait to ask questions? No, actually, uh, we'll continue to look. I'll let these people write down the names of that. We'll start the Q&A here in about 10 minutes, five minutes, if you don't mind. Okay. Do you need those out? I don't want them to be uh, I think you'll have to sign up for the video and you may have to I said I don't want to be in the video. I want to see those. Oh, okay. But you hear the lady, she doesn't want to be in the video, but she'd like to look at those. Go ahead. So when she's up here, will you shut your camera off? I don't know which one is this one. Yeah, right there. I don't know which one is this one. Right here, this one. Flying disc, living ground center. Zero on the Bikini Island. Yeah. Um, um, Boston. But they did. Yeah. Two July and a half weeks. I'm sorry. I'm and when I walked away, 29 other engineers walked away. We walked away in a group. We submitted our papers to the U.S. Supreme Court immediately through the Ninth Court, the Circuit Court of Appeals of San Francisco. Withdrawing from the job. And the Department of Justice. Have they had problems like you? Oh, yes. Quite a few people. Uh, there's another thing I might want to mention very briefly. Uh, how about cold fusion? Supposedly, uh, uh, Nobel laureate uh, phys physicist, of course, that was very quickly quashed because if cold fusion became a reality, we could make our own electricity in our kitchen uh, and, uh, and uh, make car batteries for our cars that would last forever and other kinds of things like that. Cold fusion. This is the, the, uh, uh, the chemical formula for the metal oxide uh, used in cold fusion, which is very similar to the metal oxides in alien elements and alien elements uh, used in airframes of black chips. Yeah. What? Does the average engineer in this country not? Um I haven't talked to a single engineer. I've probably talked to 400 of them so far, and everyone knows the federal government is involved up to their, up to their, their eyeballs. How about school teachers, scientists? What degree? School teachers? I've talked to many of them. They still believe that there's not a lot of bomb. Most school teachers don't think. Most school teachers, you're right, do not think. Higher education is a joke. Um, was, can you do this anymore here? Was that the plan that uh, these are the cold fusion? Yeah. And your point was that it was valid? That they... It was very valid. It was proven. Uh, uh, the people uh, 
he donated the award to Greenpeace at the end of it all. Uh, I'm a proponent of them, and I guess they do pretty good work. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, the award is $140,000 uh, for their discovery. And the U.S. military said, no, you can't, you can't do this. Now they're working with Cold Fusion in Japan. Information is forbidden to be told the public of the United States. Once again, we're treated as babies and children by our federal government structure and told that and lied to and saying that this is a bunch of I can believe. I'll tell you folks, if we don't do some serious changing and talking and talking in groups, maybe in small groups like I'm doing, but maybe not coming. You know, I'll have to come clean and come out of the woodwork, so to speak. But you have to talk in groups of what you learn. And if you do this, uh, uh, word of mouth is a wonderful thing. Uh, and uh, from that, uh, we might be able to uh, continue uh, and have our freedoms that we so aptly take for granted in these wonderful United States. And I've been in over 70 countries. I've never found another country as beautiful as the United States. Well, you know, Einstein, shortly after the first round of the law, said that... Now we're going to have the question and answer period. And yeah, it came to the nuclear, nuclear, you can find all this other. It's got to be discussed with every village of Paris. That was 50 years ago. Yeah. Question and answers, folks. Young, let's hear them. I was reading in that underground book, you know, that I first took oh, a Richard Souter book? Yeah. And he was talking about, well, I was, I've been interested in the underground railroad system ever since I heard Mel Bailey talk about it about a few years ago. I know Bill the Tunnel. But in the book, they don't tell anything about the newer <coughs> uh, drills that build the tunnels. There are no drills. No drills. No drills. It's uh, a nuclear boring machine. It's a nuclear, nuclear boring machine. It its way to the literally melts or deflagrates the rock and it, to an extremely fine powder, melts it, and sticks it on the walls. But he said in the book that he didn't know if they had ever went ahead and made that uh, machine. Well, the uh, machine's existing, but I, I can tell you even who uh, Krupp of West Germany made the machine. He had no pictures of the later of that machine. What he had was more of the obsolete machine. Even obsolete equipment can drill seven, uh, up to seven miles a day. And uh, we once again, we've been lied to when they say a quarter of a mile a day. Even through solid rock. Even through solid rock. Yes, sir. Seven miles a day. Even if they, they have to take the material out and haul it away. There's nothing to take out. There's another, nothing to take out to speak of. It's all, it's all vaporized. Here's another piece of titanium metal mixed with alien elements. Very hard material. Doesn't break. And it's uh, used in all of the black jets. Stealth aircraft. Why was the the uh, big mercury mines that were found by Las Vegas? Why were they confiscated? Mm. They run very deep. For one thing, they were used for uh, everything from atomic waste disposal to uh, 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 putting uh, bad news aliens and making a little jail out of it. I guess if you wanted to call it that. Uh, it's a good way of, uh, once again, hiding the problem from the public. So it's tied into the underground system where the mines were? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, they were just, where were they by? They were out, outside of uh, Las Vegas, I've heard. Uh, uh, they're over near Mercury, Nevada. You were talking about 129 of the underground bases and about half of them being used to house the aliens. What are the other half used for? The other half are used strategically uh, uh, by different military organizations, mostly uh, 
Army and Air Force and uh, Navy um, for uh, research and development laboratories predominantly and also uh, medical research and development laboratories and chemical weapon laboratories. Once again, these bases have been built unceasingly day and night since 1940. And if you add up all the bases, all the cost of all the bases, it's uh, pretty close to a quadrillion dollars. How can they keep this so heat in the public? Well, it's pretty easy. The people that live around the areas. It's pretty easy to keep it away from the public. Uh, they've done a real good job of it, uh, with the exception of people like myself that come out of the woodwork. Uh, those big uh, the public beliefs, beliefs the lie, the big lie. Of course, you know the old tro uh, the old adage about lies is you have to keep telling them to keep and and then you get you get to a point in time where you believe them to such a degree that uh, you become part of the lie, you live the lie. Is this where they do their cloning? Supposedly. A lot of these things are horrific beyond degree. Uh, the traumatic events that I went through caused me to get professionally taken care of by Bethesda Naval Hospital, among other places. And uh, uh, that gave me something like uh, uh, battle stress or delayed stress syndrome. I learned to uh, slowly work my way out of that. It was not easy. What's going on in Weld County, Colorado with them um, having a lot of changes and also having the most cattle mutilations in the whole world? Cattle mutilations are government-sponsored alien operations and have been since they were first started in 1967. Actually, they were probably going on much earlier. And uh, they, uh, the upshot of that was the glandular, we allow the aliens to extract glandular secretions from animals, mixing them with their own. In exchange, we'll give them plutonium products for their drive, for their uh, spaceship drives, among making alien elements for them, and they give us the uh, biological weapons. Isn't that a nice, horrible scenario? So this kind of stuff is uh, bad news indeed. By the way, being a U.S. citizen in good standing, I can't stand it anymore. I think we can do better. And if our government officials will not vote, will not uh, uh, keep, 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 in other words, if they keep telling us the big lie, keep reporting the big lie, I think it's time we not only vote them out, we demand them out. We impeach them out. And if we can't do that, I advocate just what our founding fathers say. The federal government structure out of control is totalitarian slavery. And we must vigorously fight them out. And of course, the trouble is with revolutions, folks, they always end up killing their own people. And I don't advocate the overthrow of my government. But right now, my government is not in touch with me or you, or anybody else. And uh, it's kind of moot after that. What again was the number of uh, estimated alien downed craft? Pretty close to 800,000 all total. As we speak, the Russians are shooting down two a day per province within mother motherland Russia. Southern Hemisphere, six per day. United States, one per day. And uh, Europe, one per day. It's a full-scale invasion. It's just because you don't see more of the White House. Uh, by the way, you wonder why, why don't they, well, Billy Meyer sees them. 
different. But first of all, of the 11 groups of aliens there are, four of which are benevolent, seven of which are very evil. Uh, Can you expound on the ones that are good or benevolent? Well, the, the ones purported by Billy Meyer, the Pleiadians, or Pleiadians, uh, from the seven star cluster of the Pleiades. Um, that's one of the groups. There's another group from the other side of Orion, another group uh, from uh, about 3,500 light years out, supposedly still with us. Uh, I don't remember their name offhand, but they're a very small individual, human looking, but childlike, but very large cranium, very large heads. Uh, IQ is off the scale, and they can do no wrong. They're of the angelic type there. They don't fly around with little wings or anything, but angelic, I mean, uh, they can't do wrong. They physically can't do wrong. Fire. Spielberg. They weigh about 30 pounds. 18 million. Yeah. How about the fourth one? Well, the fourth one is, a, is, a, is, a, is really two groups, and uh, they're extremely tall individuals, they're ocean, predominantly ocean, uh, deep ocean, uh, they live in deep oceans and they basically harvest our, our uh, minerals and they're, they're kind of, you can see they're always in oceans of below 20,000 feet, they're these uh, two tiered antennas found, and of course our submarines have found them years and years ago, uh, in fact during World War II some submarine warfare and encountered several at very shallow depth. They didn't know whose weapon or, or whatever they were. Are the aliens our biggest threat or is our federal government the biggest threat? Both are our major threat at the present time. It's about enough we have one, we have a little one too. Does, does World County, Colorado have an underground base in that area? Colorado has three underground bases, uh, one at DIA, uh, I believe what you mentioned, what, what was it, Weld? Weld County is the biggest, one of the biggest counties in the yeah. United States. And I believe it's in the northeastern section of that county, if I remember right. I'd have to look at a map. I can identify every 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 base on a map. I have, I have the latitudes and longitudes of such bases. By the way, if I mention that, that does entail espionage. If I mention all of them, and I cannot do that to the crowd, and I want to keep on talking as much as I can, so I'm not, that's one thing I promise to do, but I have to break my promise, and I'll tell you that I was wrong to do anything. I, I, was, I encountered something when I was back in case I could find something. You'll have to speak. I, 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 I visited. Minnesota, I was coming back and I decided to take a different route to get off of the interstate to the big U.S. Highway 36 across northern Kansas. And about 20 miles from the Colorado border, there was suddenly some construction. construction. The 36 was completely cut off. They had detours and went way around. I didn't do that. I just went down and found I set it. So over that area, about, I guess, 15 minutes later, I saw a strange formation of clouds. Perfect for cells. Mm -hmm. and, they're, uh, and, and, I, and I was convinced there's something that they were active. And they were used to cut off the U.S. highway. The name of those clouds is all, if I can interrupt, is also cumulus lenticulatus or lens shaped clouds. Yeah. Almost always predominantly, uh, there are two kinds of clouds. The kind, if you go up to Virginia City sometime in April or May, you'll see these clouds that come right up, up roaring up to Steep Mountain. You'll look at them and they'll just disappear. They'll cease to go over your shoulders, nothing. It's kind of a that's also cumulus lenticulatus A. And the B the kind, it almost looks as like a black uh, thunderstorm like cloud. And they always have metallic discs in the center. And if you uh, take a, a, your camera, your eye won't probably see them. The camera will pick up uh, metallic uh, uh, dots within that cloud structure and those dots can be professionally analyzed and you come up with the you'll come up with the uh, the, the, the conclusion of the air flying disc. Yes. Yeah. 
have already ever seen those clouds more than 23 miles from mountains. But I had that much at least 200 air miles, straight line distance from long speeds. I have, spotted, I have spotted such near Portland, Oregon, and took pictures, submitting it to a TV radio station and a TV and radio station. It never got on the air. I wonder why. But they're rare clouds. You never have a chance to take a picture of them. Should. What causes the clouds? Well, uh, the natural formation, of course, is uh, also cumulus. There. They're, they're of extremely high cumulus cloud formation. Of course, cumulus is a building, a big kind of like a thunderhead or a thundercloud. Uh, air currents rushing up, and, and of course, uh, with the ultra cumulus ones, balloon shaped or cookie shaped clouds, you have air currents rushing up. Is, right? Excuse me, air currents rushing up and air currents rushing down. And what they do is they compress the clouds, and, and then there's air circulation generally in a count, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise measure. I studied weather when I was in high school. That was one of our curricula. But you've got it right there. It's the main main one of sorts. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, the A-bomb is a, uh, the A-bomb cloud is a lenticulatus. We're downing one a day in this country. Wouldn't it seem logical that there would be more people that would be aware of debris? No, I'll tell you why. As soon as one is down, they're attacking certain northern tier state air force bases, predominantly. Uh, if you can get on those bases or stray onto those air force bases without getting a rest, good luck. But uh, if one of those craft is down, uh, they seal off the whole area, period. They being the federal government, the police and whatnot, air force police or whatever, air base or or army base or tank base or whatever you got in that area. They seal off the whole area. Anybody caught in there is shot on site or they're immediately arrested and detained. By the way, a military base can circumvent the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. An Indian reservation can do the same thing. Is this what our government this was supposed to have been laid out by our founding fathers? I don't believe so. I think we can do better. I know we can do better. I also know that our present government's stature is uh, so punitive, it's very reminiscent of early Nazi days with Adolf Hitler. In fact, New World Order was taken from his manifesto, so to speak. 1933, he actually said, we will form a new world order. Where was the third one in Colorado? He said one was DIA, the second one was at Northeastern Protocol, Weld County. One is down, I believe, uh, you know where Telluride, Colorado is? Yeah. Okay, okay it's due east of Telluride by about 13 or 14. can't miss it because if you take some of the side roads, you'll see uh, vented air shafts coming right out of the rock. That's typical of an underground base. Or if you're traveling along by car, by, by jet, you'll see a truncated mountain. Remember the truncated mountain? You saw as we were curving around one of the Las Vegas and the plane was banking like this. And I said, hey, yeah, look at the deep underground military base. The cockpit door was open. It says, oh God, and they, what they did is they did this and, and worked around and, and just as you got your camera out. Right. <laughs> oh, I already had a picture of it. And that was, uh, by the way, one of the bases at S4 because it had circled around Area 51. That was one of the bases. So we, I actually saw it from the air instead of there was, you know, for about 30,000. How deep are they? They can run, uh, the deepest deep underground military base is two and a half miles underground. Uh, the Dulce base is two and a half miles underground. That's pretty close to uh, 13,000 feet. 5,280 feet make a mile. You don't have any temperature or high temperature problems? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, in certain sandstones, you actually get a lower temperature than all the ground surface. Your water, water, water leaches out. Of course, that has to be sealed. 
protective sealant. Very difficult in some cases. By the way, this ring I'm wearing is a, has a sapphire. When you blow mountains apart, there's sapphires in mountains. I have that professionally uh, cut. Where it kind of is a good luck piece. It's a blonde six ray star sapphire, American star sapphire. It's been working. Yes. <laughs> you might have. I had to. I had it cut and polished and, and uh, the setting made in Las Vegas for some of my different days. Yeah. Well, you, what about when you're you're just driving along and it seems to be nothing around and you'll see these white pipes coming out of the ground with turbines on the top? Exactly. That's Is that one? That's, that's one there's, type. There's one of those that's in an Denver. I mean, I've seen them along the highways in Denver. It's like industrial or commercial stuff over here, and then all of a sudden you see all these white tubings along the highway. Yeah. Those are air shafts. Or some of them are run very deep. Some of them are run minimum only four or five hundred feet underground. You know, you don't have to be a military tactic tactics to see that's very vulnerable. Plug those things up, and pump some bad gas down there while having it. Well, I guess uh, I'm not a tactician, so, so. Yeah. that's. Yeah, that's one way of telling Yes, sir. Are there any of those underground bases in Nebraska or Kansas? In every state, there's at least two. Do you know where they are in Nebraska? I'd have to look on a map. I, I couldn't be have uh, tell you. How they often? Big part? How they often? Air Force Base. Yeah, probably often. <laughs> It's also where they took some of the alien uh, alien remains and saucer remains right off the bat off of Air Force Service. Okay, any more questions? One they, more question. Do they have an uh, underground base up by Stone Air? Or yes, sir. Yes, yes, we do, and it's a very deep base indeed. In fact, they're going to make it deeper than any other base. They want to take it four miles down. What's it called again? What is it? Sedona, Arizona. Is that one that's just north? A lot of the, I beg your pardon? Just northeast of the, or north Yes, north. just northwest. Well, that's all, folks. And I think I better leave some time for Al Bailey. And I better munch a sandwich before before I become an alien. <laughs> anyway, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope I've had a uh, you've had some hand-on experience. By the way, there's some little metallic fragments you might be able to pick up. I don't know. They might be alien. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right.